UFC Louisville has 14 fights, which means there are 28 fighters to choose from while building a DraftKings fantasy lineup. My name is Angelo. This is We Want Picks. I'm going to break down the entire UFC Louisville fight card, giving you my picks, predictions, and DraftKings plays. But before we break down the card, let's celebrate. Let's celebrate the success of one of our premium members, Bogey Turp. Bogey Turp went out there last week at UFC 302 and won $7,500. He won $7,500 playing DraftKings Fantasy. And it didn't stop there. He didn't just take his $7,500 of winnings and put it in his pocket. He then went out of his way to tweet and reach out to us saying, I have been a subscriber of yours for over a year now, and I listen to Angelo and Jacob religiously on everything MMA. I was finally able to construct this winning lineup thanks to all of your info and tools from being a premium member. Best subscription I have ever been a part of. Well, thank you, Bogey Terp. Congratulations to you, Bogey Terp. And this is what it's all about. He won $7,500. Even if he had been a premium membership for two full years and won nothing. $7,500 of winnings is five years of premium membership. Premium membership is only $10 for an entire month. And not only do we give you the picks and the bets, we give you tools and insight to help you bet on MMA, to help you have better picks with MMA, to help you build winning DraftKings fantasy lineups. The only thing you need to do to become a premium member is go to wewantpicks.com, click become a member at the top. It's freaking $10. It's $10, and Bogey is not the only one. We have had over $560,000 in winning tickets sent our way in the last six months. Not the last year, not the last 10 years, not since we've been doing it, the last six months. And these are only the tickets that premium members send us, let alone the ones that don't. We want picks.com, click become a member at the top. It's freaking $10. That $10 is going to give you UFC Louisville. UFC Vegas 93, UFC Saudi Arabia, and UFC 303, all for that $10. That's $2.50 an event. And premium membership gets you access to the picks, the bets, of course, but also the best DraftKings ownership projections in the game. If you play DraftKings Fantasy, you know how wildly important the ownership projections are, and we quite literally have the best projections on planet Earth. We're beating the Osimos, the Roto Grinders. We're beating these massive companies that the only thing they do is DraftKings Fantasy. Every Friday when the weigh-ins are done before 6 p.m. Eastern time, this cheat sheet will be fully loaded with the DraftKings ownership projections, the scoring projections, the leverage plays, and then we will let you know who should be in your cash pools, who should be in your GPP pools, and all of that amazing data, which I just told you is the best in the game, will be preloaded into the DraftKings Optimizer. You click a couple of buttons and this builds lineups for you. It'll build 150 lineups for you with a couple clicks of the button. All of this, a million other things, we want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. It is freaking $10 for an entire month. Look, here's we want picks.com. This is a giant button that you click, become a premium member. Click, bang, $10. Unlock everything you need. Let's go ahead and break down this card. There are 14 fights, which again means there are 28 fighters to choose from. We did have a weight miss on the scale. Weigh-ins are not 100% done yet, but the rest should be good. Mora missed weight. She is a bit of a, as Jacob puts it, a weight bully, kind of larger for the division, but that fight should continue. She didn't miss by like 38 pounds, so we should be good there. But let's go ahead and break down this card. Opening up the UFC Louisville fight card, we have Ryan Dos Santos, potentially Ryan Amanda, depending on your sports book or where you're looking, and she's taking on Pooja Tomar. Rayan Amanda, or Rayan Dos Santos, is an aggressive grappler. Her striking is okay. It is fluid. She is pretty busy, but she's incredibly light on her feet. She's constantly moving and looking to grapple. She will take you down. She won't be overly aggressive about it, but she will take you down. And then when you are on the ground, she's got a good balance of ground and pound as well as positions and control and submissions. Her takedown defense is solid, but she's not going to need that here. This is all going to come down to getting takedowns. And I think she does. She is fighting UFC newcomer Pooja Tamar. Pooja Tamar is being advertised as the first Indian female fighter in the UFC. 
She doesn't have the greatest record in the world, but she is very exciting. She's tiny. She's tiny, tiny, tiny. But she comes forward wildly aggressive. She will just bomb away with the strikes, moving forward, trying to finish her opponents. Every single thing she throws is with 100% intent. She is trying to take your head off every step of the way. She doesn't necessarily have that wild one-punch power, especially considering how tiny she is, but she is busy. She is active. She is exciting to watch. She is pretty. She is somebody the UFC is going to be looking to push, and I am shocked that they gave her a matchup like this because I think Rian Dos Santos just takes her down, does whatever the hell she wants because Puja has no takedown defense. Her takedown defense absolutely sucks. This is a bizarre matchup. I don't... The UFC knows what they're doing. They know how to build stars. They know how to do all that, but this seems like a miss to me. Yeah, Pooja's not undefeated or anything like that, but why even have her here? Why even bring her in if you're not going to try to build her up? She's attractive. She is from the second most populated country on planet Earth. She has a huge fan base already, and she has a fun fight style. Why would you not give her a matchup she can win? I don't think she can win this matchup. She doesn't have the one-punch crushing knockout power that she would need, and she doesn't have the takedown defense to keep this standing. So Rian Dos Santos wins this fight, and while $9,100 seems steep, I think she ends up being worth it because she'll get whatever takedown she wants. She'll get the finish, potentially. And Rayondo Santos is probably worth that money. You know who's not worth that money? Frenchman Taylor Lapolis taking on Cody Stamen. And I specify Frenchman. I went out of my way to say his country of origin because he fights like a Frenchman. He's got that very technical striking but low volume take no risks style as some of these Frenchmen do. Not all of them. We got Benoit saint out there putting caution to the wind. But Terry Lapolis is cautious. He will take his time. He will not overcommit. He will not put himself in the harm's way. He is primarily a striker who is developing some very, very good takedown defense. He is coming off that loss to Fareed Bajarat. That's a quality loss. Fareed is a good fighter. And Taylor was able to defend the takedowns. His takedown defense looked absolutely incredible. The problem is he was so focused on defending takedowns, he didn't think about what to do offensively. 15-minute fight. A 15-minute fight landed 41 strikes. That's not good. That's not good at all. He was a little bit too low volume. I think he was squarely focused on not getting taken down. And for the most part, that was successful, but it didn't win him the fight because you also have to throw punches to win fights. He's taking on Cody Stamen. Cody Stamen's coming back after a year away. He has been gone, and now he's back. He's a guy that's been around for a while. He's been competing in martial arts, combat sports, basically the entirety of his life. He's been wrestling his entire life at all levels. Elementary school, middle school, high school, college. He's been boxing since he was 16 years old. He's a good technical striker. He sets a nice pace. Doesn't really have that raw one-punch knockout power, but he does come forward. He does stay in your face, and he looks to mix up the striking and the grappling. This is an interesting matchup because Taylor Lapidus is the better fighter. Just I think he's the better, more skilled fighter. But Cody Stamen is exactly the type of guy that can stay in your face, move forward, and squeak out a win. He can hold you against the cage. He'll box with you a little bit. Taylor should be better. He should be more accurate. That just incredible footwork of his should be able to get it done. So Taylor's going to be the pick. But I'm not spending $8,900 on Taylor Lapolis and DraftKings. The guy doesn't score well. He just doesn't score well. He's not going to finish Cody Stamen. And he's not going to be high volume enough to win with any sort of meaningful amount of points in DraftKings. So he's out of it. If you do think Cody wins, Cody does somewhat well in his wins. Not incredible, but if he gets the wrestling going, he can do well. He finished Eddie Wideland, but that was several years ago at this point. I'm going to fade both of these guys because I don't think Cody wins, and I do think Taylor is just way overpriced for his fighting style and the points that he puts up on the board. Then we have Eduardo Mora taking on Denise Gomes. Eduardo Mora missed weight. She missed weight. And maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't. She is a bit of a weight bully. She uses that size, using that strength, that physicality to push you around, take you down. She took down national wrestling champion Montserrat Ruiz three times in that fight. Three times took her down and then finished her in the second round. And that's how Eduardo Mora fights. She bombs on her feet. Striking is not great, but she will come across the cage, bomb away, initiate the takedowns, and look to get it done on the ground. She's taking on Denise Gomes. Denise Gomes is interesting because Denise Gomes came out there, knocked out Yasmin Yaryui in all of four seconds. I was there in person live. Knocked her out almost immediately. She was a four-to-one dog, I believe. Yasmin Yaryui was a big favorite. 
supposed to be this incredible striker. And Denise Gomes said, bye-bye, bye, and smoked her. Denise Gomes also just got taken down by Angela Hill four times in that fight. Sorry, five times. It's even worse than I could have ever imagined. Five times she was taken down by Angela Hill in that fight. Overall, Denise Gomes is a decent striker with some okay grappling. She's not great at anything, but she is tough as shit. And she will come forward and she will stay in your face. She can pick up the pace. She has no problem taking a shot to give a shot. But I think she's just bullied. I think she's pushed around. I think she's taken down over and over and over again. Even if she can survive, I just think she's going to get taken down a million times. The two fights that she lost, Angela Hill took her down five times. Loma Look Boomy. Loma Look Boomy is tiny. She's a tiny little thing. And she was taking down Denise Gomes like it didn't matter either. It's obviously a gaping hole in her MMA game is a takedown defense. Eduardo Mora should be able to exploit that. She took down national wrestling champion three times before finishing her. Eduardo Mora is going to be the pick. I was comfortable with her yesterday at the $8,800 price point, but the weight miss, she's going to need to keep a pace because Denise is not a quitter and she will stay tough. So I may end up fading Eduardo at the $8,800 because of that weight miss. If she already doesn't have amazing cardio and she tried to cut the weight and couldn't, then we might have to worry about that a little bit. But I am confident that she gets it done. Then we have John Sexy Mexi Castaneda. Listen, I didn't come up with that nickname. I'm not just sitting here as a 40-year-old suburban guy talking about how sexy John... That's I didn't come up with that nickname. That's not me. That's his nickname. And the reason I have to go out of my way to say that is when we broke down this fight live... I said, John Sexy Mexi Castaneda. And people were like, oh my God, so sus. Oh, that's sus. I didn't come up with the name. It's his name. I am not saying what he is. I'm just saying his nickname. So Jonathan, who is sexy and Mexican Castaneda, is fighting Daniel Marcos. What's interesting here is he is a favorite in DraftKings. $8,200 is favorite money. But in real life, he is the betting underdog. If we look at his scores... He scores pretty well in his wins. He's not blowing it out, but 95 in a decision, 85 in a decision, 83. He submitted Miles Johnson and only scored 83. But the reality is he does cover his salary when he wins. And this is a tricky price point because John Sexy Mexi Castaneda comes forward, sets a pace with the striking, will work in takedowns here and there. He is a former Division II wrestler, so he has actual collegiate wrestling. He's not just diving at legs cluelessly. And he sets an incredible pace. And he's a guy that will work in both of those things. He'll strike with you, strike with you, strike with you, boom, takedown when you don't expect it. I think John Castaneda could absolutely win this fight. I'm torn on the money, $8,200. I wish he was a little bit more affordable. I wish he was underdog money on DraftKings Fantasy since he is underdog money in the betting realm, but I do think he gets it done. He is fighting Daniel Marcos. Daniel Marcos is undefeated, 15-0. and And on the surface, that seems incredible. Oh my God, 15-0, and that's insane. He barely beat Davy Grant. A lot of people think he lost that fight. The dude landed 49 strikes. He won a fight and scored 55 points. He won a fight. Won the fight, 55 points. You get 30 for winning, which means he only scored 25 points, which is awful. He's definitely a fade in DraftKings, even if he wins this fight. It's a full fade. But he barely beat David Grant. A lot of people think he didn't win this fight. He knocked a Corey Lang's testicles up into his stomach. A Corey Lang, a Richie Lang threw up his testicles. Threw, he threw them up. Because Daniel Marcos blasted him in the dick two times in a row. Not like, bang, bang. Just, Kleh. hey, don't do it again. Boom. Next kick. Right. Just threw up his own nuts. He's not out here dominating like what you would think a 15-0 fighter is doing. You look a little closer and it's like, okay. I think John Castaneda wins this fight. I'm full fading Daniel Marcos at $8,000. He's not worth that money. He's not going to finish John Castaneda. So even if he squeaks out a decision, look at what could happen. You could spend $8,000 on the guy and he puts up 55 points. And if he's a dog at $6,000, $6,800, that's incredible. Not as a favorite in the betting world or not at $8,000 salary here. Fading Daniel Marcos, I do think Sexy Mexi can get it done. Then we have Andrea Lee taking on Montana De La Rosa. This is a rematch. Blah, 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 blah. And the reason I'm making those stupid noises, people are like, I didn't mention it was a rematch because I don't care. It happened in 2019. We're talking five years ago. Five years. I don't care. 
It was five years ago. If you think nothing has changed between these two in five years, who cares? It doesn't matter that it's a rematch. It does not matter. Andrea Lee won the first time, put up 70 points. And you know what? If she wins this and puts up 70 points, you're going to look real stupid spending $8,500 on her. I would not spend $8,500 on her. I do think she wins this fight, though. Andrea Lee's the better striker, and that's what she is. She's a technical striker who has learned to work takedowns offensively into her game. She's got a good amount of takedowns in her last couple of fights. Took down Miranda Maverick twice. Took down Macy Barber five times. Took down Arujo once. So she has seven, eight takedowns in her last four fights, which is impressive for a primarily striking-based fighter like Andrea Lee. She's taken on Montana De La Rosa. Montana De La Rosa, sneakily the prettiest woman in this division. Just super sneaky. Nobody talks about it because she carries herself like a woman and not like, a, you know, posting ridiculous pictures she didn't be posting. But she's just like super sneaky, the prettiest woman in this division. And she's a wrestler. She's been wrestling the majority of her life. She didn't just start fighting and then start wrestling. She's been wrestling. She wrestled competitively long before her MMA career. The problem is, while she should win this fight with the wrestling, she wasn't able to get it going with J.J. Aldrich. Obviously, Tatiana Suarez taking her down is not going to be the easiest thing to do. Macy Barber is sneaky good and keeps winning fights. My biggest issue here is both of these women are on bad losing streaks, but they're both to, to good competition. These are all quality losses. You lost to Macy Barber, Tatiana Suarez, and J.J. Aldrich, who's like trash or good, depending on the day. Those are not the worst losses in the world. My problem is in this J.J. Aldrich fight, she only attempted one takedown. If she, had, I would rather she attempted 10 and got none of them. I would prefer that. She only attempted one. You only tried to do your best thing one time in that fight. I can't trust that. Andrea Lee's going to be the pick, but don't spend $8,500 on freaking Andrea Lee. That's nuts to do. Nuts. And then we have Brad Katana and Jesse Butler. Brad Katana, squarely the biggest favorite on this card. And let's take a look at his salaries. $9,600. That seems like a lot for a guy that doesn't really finish people. But he scored 97 points in his win over Cody Gibson. If we go back a few years, a couple of losses here. And then before that, again, it's so far back, it doesn't matter. If you don't think he's evolved since 2018, what are we doing here? Brad Katana has won two different seasons of The Ultimate Fighter. He beat Cody Gibson to win the last season. He put up 97 points with zero takedowns whatsoever. He landed 173 strikes. 160 of them were significant. And he scored 97 points. And that's who he is. He's a busy striker who will set a pace, stay in your face, and can work in the wrestling. He lost to Garrett Arnfield. A lot of people think that that was a bad decision. So let's say it was a bad decision. You give him 30 points for the decision. Now he has an 86-point win on an $8,800 salary. That is tough. It's a tough pill to swallow. You at least want them to cover their salary. So if he's $9,600, I need at least 96 points out of him. At least. Brad Katana's right on the fringe, though, because he's fighting, objectively, the worst fighter on this card. He's literally fighting the worst fighter on this card. He should dominate this fight. He could potentially win by finish, even though he's not a finisher. He also could work in 173 significant strikes. I don't think he's going to wrestle because his opponent, Jesse Butler, has sneaky jujitsu. Brad Katana should win this fight, though. Losing that fight to Garrett Arnfield while still landing four takedowns is impressive because it just shows you that he can make decisions on the fly. He's not a wrestler, but he's like, listen, Garrett Arnfield's marching forward, standing in my face. I need to mix this up a little bit. I need to shoot some takedowns. And then he did, and he got four of them. I think Brad Katana wins this fight, $9,600. Man, part of me wants to do it, and part of me is like, that's a lot of money to spend for a guy that doesn't finish. But again, he's fighting the worst fighter in this card. I'm, Jesse, if you're watching this, I'm sorry. Like, somebody's the best, somebody's the worst. That's just life. This is not participation trophy. And you showed up and you got knocked out by a 40-year-old Jim Miller in like two seconds. You landed one strike and got put to sleep at 155 pounds. And then the decision was, hey, I'm already chinny. Let me lose 20 more pounds, fight at 135 pounds, and maybe I'll do well. I don't see it happening. Jesse Butler does have skills. I mean, he's a professional MMA fighter that has 17 fights. He has skills. He knows how to fight. But he's not great at anything. Striking is a little sloppy. Takedowns are just okay. Takedown defense is terrible. Jiu-jitsu sneaky, though. He can snatch something up very, very quickly. 
Jesse Butler's going to lose this fight. So the question really becomes how many points will Brad Katana score? I might shoot my shot at the $9,600. Then we have Carlos Prates taking on Charlie Radke. Listen, Carlos Prates, big time striker. He loves striking so much, he tattooed Muay Thai across his chest, which is insane to do. He is 18 and six. He has lost six times. And people are talking about him like he's never lost. People are talking about him like he's the, the, an undefeated super killer. He's not. Carlos Prates in this win against Trevin Giles. Wow, he put up 95 points. He knocked him out with one punch. He must be the man. Watch the fight. Trevin Giles was, was beating him. Trevin Giles was winning a striking match against Carlos Prates. Was winning the striking match. And then Carlos landed that one big punch. Was very low volume, doing nothing, landed that one big punch. But he is a very good striker. He does clearly have that one punch knockout power. So the question becomes, will he land it? He's fighting Charlie Ratke. Charlie Ratke is a grappler. He is a grappler. But we saw his hands in the Urbina fight. Knocked him out pretty early. Knocked him out clean on the feet. He just fought Blood Diamond in his UFC debut in September. Blood Diamond, Mike Matheta. Not a lisp. That's just how you say it. Blood Diamond it was also a very high-level kickboxer like Carlos Prates. And he beat him. He had no problem being boring, holding him against the cage, trying to work takedowns. No problem doing that. And that matters. That I don't care, boomy, calling people uh, the F word. It almost gives you a little bit of confidence that he doesn't care. I'm here to win fights. And I will come out and I will swing like a man. But if I'm worried about the power, I'll hold you against the cage. I'll try to take you down. He is a grappler after all. I think Charles Radke wins this fight. I picked him to win. I think he wins this fight. I think Carlos Prates, watching him get lit up by Trevin Giles before landing that punch was not good. I think Charlie Radke at $7,000 is a great underdog and I will probably spend that money. What I will say though, is the marching forward staying in the face, that could be a problem. He could march forward, get into Carlos Protest's face, and then just get slapped. That could happen. Hopefully it doesn't, but that could happen. I like Charlie Ratke to win, $7,000. I think, you, 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 listen, especially we got some heavy favorites here, you need a little bit of money in your budget. Then we have the featured prelim. We have Ludovic Klein taking on Tiago Moises. Ludovic Klein is a very good striker. This is striker versus grappler. Ludovic Klein's a very good striker. He's smooth. He's fast. He's accurate. He's all the things. Good takedown defense at 83%. And he's got phenomenal striking as well. He's coming off this win over AJ Cunningham, but AJ, not UFC caliber guy. Ludovic Klein was like a minus 900 favorite and looked like it. Got it done. In this fight, he is $8,400. The risk here though is that even when Ludovic wins, he doesn't necessarily score a ton of points. The Bahamandes fight, he worked in some takedowns. Wasn't winning the striking exchanges. He said, let me grapple. He grappled. And that was a great decision to make. And he won that fight. I do think Ludovic is going to win this fight because I think he can defend the takedowns, but I don't think I'm going to spend the money. He's taking on Tiago Moises. Tiago is objectively the best fighter that Ludovic has fought so far. Certainly the most accomplished, certainly the most experienced fighter that he has fought. Tiago Moises has been around the block. Fought Joel Alvarez, Benoit Saint Denis, fought Islam Makachev. He's fought everybody. Bobby Green, Tamir Ismagulo, Demir Ismagulo. He's and Benil Darius. I mean, he's fought everybody. He's been around forever. He's fought everybody. Very experienced guy that has had quite a bit of success. The problem is he's not the better striker. He needs to get the takedowns to win. I think Ludovic Klein's takedown defense holds up. And I think Ludovic Klein wins a striking match. I'm just not going to spend the money on Ludovic because I don't think. I don't think he's going to put away Tiago. Tiago's insanely, insanely tough. And so then we just have a striking match, which isn't going to score incredibly well. Tiago Moises is the pick. Then we have the main card opener. Punahil Soriano taking on Miguel Baeza. Listen, this is a sloppy fight. And if you're building a safe cash game type entry, single entry tournament, if you're trying to get the safe money, a 50-50, a double up, stuff like that, don't touch this fight. But if you're chasing that big payout, if you're looking for the $75,000, the $50,000, the big payout, the large tournament, the GPPs, you need to pick a side here. Because whoever wins this fight is going to score well. And to be squarely on one side or the other is a little ridiculous. We got two guys that have been knocked out like crazy. Puna Hill Soriano, Division Three All-American wrestler. Does he wrestle? Let's take a look. 
one takedown five years ago. So no, he doesn't wrestle. But he is a Division Three All-American wrestler. He's a fluid striker. He's got some big one-punch power in his hands. He's a tough guy, but he does get finished. He was taken down, submitted by Stolzfus. He was knocked out by Kopilov, knocked out by Lungambula. Lost to Nick Maximoff. That was honestly the most embarrassing of all the losses. The other ones are respectable. All right, Brendan Allen, he's on a streak. Pudi Hill Soriano, tough guy, big power, unreliable. Taking on Miguel Baeza. Miguel Baeza, two-year layoff. A little more than two years, actually, because it was April 16th, 2022 was his last fight. Knocked out by Paulo Fialo. Where'd that guy go? Before that, knocked out by Chaos Williams. Before that, lost a decision to Ponzinibbio. He's been gone for two years. He's on a three-fight losing streak. Was knocked out in his last two fights, and he has priced at $8,700. Are we crazy? Are we crazy? What are we missing? He's a good technical striker. He's got solid BJJ. He's probably the better fighter if we just look at the actual skills. But a two-year layoff, two knockouts in a row against a guy like Punahil Soriano, who is dangerous, who can land that one big punch. Punahil coming down in weight from middleweight to welterweight. There are so many variables here. I'm not touching it. I'm a cash game kind of guy. I'm not the large tournament, let's go chase it. The optimizer will help you build that lineup. The insight will help you get there. The ownership projections will help you get there. You are going to need exposure to both of these gentlemen if you're building that large tournament because whoever wins this fight will score really well. But I'm not going to touch it for a single entry cash game. I am picking Puna Hill Soriano to win. It's absurd to me that this is not a pick 'em 50 50 fight. It's crazy to me. How the hell is Miguel Baeza three losses in a row, two knockouts, hasn't fought in more than two years? How the hell is he showing up at $8,700? It's beyond me. That makes absolutely no sense. Have some exposure for your large tournament entries. Then we have Julian Marquez taking on Zach Reese. Julian Marquez is another guy that people are well behind. People are loving Julian Marquez here, and I get it. His nickname is the Cuban Missile Crisis. He comes out there. He can fight like a man. He'll throw big. He's a pretty well-rounded guy. He's incredibly tough. He does fade as fights go on. He's not Mr. Cardio. All nine of his wins are by stoppage. And they're a mixed bag of knockouts and submissions. But even in his submissions, let's take a look. Submissions, zero takedowns. Submissions, zero takedowns. Submissions, zero takedowns. He's snatching things up in scrambles. He's finding stuff. He's a well-rounded guy who wants to bang with you, but if you give him the opportunity, he'll snatch a neck. He'll make something happen. And that's essentially Julian Marquez in a nutshell. He finishes, but he fades. He's tough, but he can be finished. And he just got a standing KO loss to Mark andre Barreau, where he had some early success, but he was just getting hit way too much. He is taking on Zach Reese. Zach Reese is a bit of a prospect. He's a massive guy for this weight class at six foot four. He uses his size. He uses his strength. He seems very tight and like very tightly wound, and then he'll bomb away. He has some jujitsu nerd in him, which is a problem. That's what happened to him last time. He ended up on the ground with Cody Brunish, threw up a triangle, and then was just kabooshed on his head. Just power bombed on his head, knocked out. But I still believe in Zach Reese. I think he's very tall. Very long. And obviously he was knocked out, but he was knocked out because he was power bombed. He does get hit a little too much, but he's got a pretty decent chin. I think Zach Reese can win this fight. I think Zach Reese can look pretty good in this fight. He may end up being the prospect that people thought he was before he got power bombed by Cody Brundage. But I don't think I'm going to have either one of these guys in my lineup. There is a school of thought out there that Julian Marquez is the more battle-tested fighter, the more experienced fighter, the better fighter. You got to bet on him. And that's not insane logic but he's also a guy that seems squarely focused on only fans and some other stuff he's a guy that got pieced up on the feet and finished on the feet in his last fight and yes Mark andre is pretty good but I, I can't really count on either one of these guys if zach was a far more affordable he might be worth that money but after watching him get power bombed, it's kind of hard to trust him. then we have dustin stoltzfus and bruno fajeda this should be the easiest breakdown on the card it just should be Somebody's a trap, and it might be Bruno Fajeda, but we got Dustin Stolzfus. Dustin Stolzfus, busy striker. He's got very good power, but he also has no chin whatsoever. He has a BJJ black belt, and he's been using it a little more. He's got 10 takedowns in his last four fights. He's been going to the wrestling a little bit more, 
And that's going to need to be his game plan here because he does not have the chin to hang around for a slugfight. He just doesn't have the chin for it. And he might be in some trouble because he's taking on Bruno Fajeda. Bruno Fajeda will bomb away. He will knock you out. His UFC debut against Gregory Rodriguez knocked this dude out and knocked him out quick. Real quick. Phil Hawes knocked him out. And Phil Hawes is a guy that can be knocked out, so that one's not astonishing. But knocking out the Gregory Rodriguez the way he did was impressive. He did lose to Nurselton Ruzaboyev, but Nurselton Ruzaboyev is another guy. The guy's 6'5" threw a straight down the middle and got him. And it is what it is. Point being with all this is Bruno Fajeda is a powerful, fast guy that can knock your head off. Dustin Stolzfus has no chin. Bruno Fajeda can grapple as well. Not really looking to do it, doesn't need to do it, but he can grapple as well. I think Bruno Fajeda wins this fight. I think he knocks out Dustin Stolzfus. I need to, think you need to have him in your lineup at $9,400. What could happen is Dustin Stolzfus continues to freaking shock the world. Gets his takedowns, and all of a sudden, he looks like an Olympic wrestler. These are fist fights. Anything can happen, but I'm just going to I'm gonna go with the obvious here. The guy with the insane power should knock out the guy that has no chin. That's what should happen here, and sometimes you just got to follow the breadcrumbs. Then we have Raul Rosas Jr. to take on Ricky Tertios. This fight was supposed to happen back in February. It was booked. They weighed in. They did all the things on fight night. Before it was time to walk out to the cage, the fight was canceled. They scrapped it. And that is unfortunate because Raul Rosas Jr. is coming off of this punch knockout, a striking standing knockout over Terrence Mitchell. And that's impressive because Raul Rosas Jr. is a grappler. He's 19 years old. He's super young. And he's just a non-stop wrestler. Two takedowns, three takedowns, two minutes of control time before the sub, 550 against Rodriguez before he completely death gassed. And then there was some criticism. Well, how good is he? What kind of mistakes is he going to make? And then he knocked out Terrence Mitchell. Raul Rochas Jr. should win this fight. He should get the takedowns. He should win this fight. I personally am not even going to consider the $9,300. While he does cover his salary and his wins, I think it's a weird matchup here because he's fighting Ricky Tertios. Ricky Tertios is not phenomenal. Ricky Tertios is not even dangerous. What he is, though, is busy and a dog. If you look at this Kevin Natividad fight, he won this fight. He put up 114 points. He had three reversals. He had two takedowns of his own. He also was taken down seven times. He was taken down seven times in that fight. And he still snuck out the win because of the relentless pressure. His ability to make every single exchange a filthy grappling match to make every single exchange loaded with scrambles Ricky Tertios can create chaos he's like a cartoon with just the cloud and limbs are shooting out all over the place and that's how he fights and if Raul Rosas Jr. gets the takedowns and Ricky turns these into wild scrambles we don't know what's going to happen on those scorecards so Ricky Tertios at $6,900 is far far better value than Raul Rosas at the 94-3, whatever the hell it was. I'm fading Raul. I may consider Ricky for my lineup. Raul should win. He's the pick to win this fight. Don't, don't confuse my words here. I'm picking Raul Rosas to win this fight. But we're looking at DraftKings scoring. Unless he gets 10 takedowns, tons of control time, dominates, potentially wins by finish, he's not going to be worth that salary. And I don't know if those things all happen with a guy like Ricky Tertios. Then we have the co-main event of the evening, Dustin Jacoby versus Dominic Reyes. This is an interesting one because Dustin Jacoby should absolutely win this fight. He's a high-level kickboxer. He has been competing in professional kickboxing, MMA, for plenty of time. And if we go back just two years, look at this incredible win streak that he was on. Incredible win streak. He had one, two, three, four, five, six wins in a row. Seven fights where he didn't lose. Knocked out Da Woon Jung. Da Woon Jung, I think, was on a 16-fight win streak himself. He beat McCall Olin Jachuk. Knocked out Stewart. And the knockouts are what's tricky here because he's not typically a big one-punch knockout kind of guy. He is a very durable guy, though. He was dropped by Alonzo Menafield, but won every other exchange outside of the getting dropped. Kennedy and Chuck Wu finished him, which was very impressive. And why this is interesting is he's fighting Dominic Reyes. Dominic Reyes is a guy that hasn't sniffed a win in multiple years. He hasn't even considered a win in five years. He went out there 
a young guy, undefeated, went out there, 12-0, and fought John Jones for the title and arguably beat John Jones and bought into his own hype. He lost to John Jones in a, in a sketchy decision and then bought into his own hype, considered himself, I'm the best in the world, they just got it wrong. And then smoked by Jan Blahovich, smoked by Yuri Prohaska, smoked by Ryan Spann. And before you tell me the Prohaska fight, oh, he looked pretty good in that fight and the strikes, he, he had Yuri in a lot of trouble, arguably had him knocked out. But what was the outcome? And if you have to go back three full years to a fight where he was unconscious on the floor to tell me how good Dominic Reyes is, I think you're doing this wrong. I don't think Dominic Reyes wins this fight. I think Dominic Reyes is full washed. And actually, this fight's in the Midwest, so he's worst. Dominic Reyes is worst. He's not winning this fight. He is massive. He does have skills. He fought an absolute game of a fight against John Jones. But I will remind you, John Jones, for being what some people consider the greatest fighter of all time, John Jones has a bunch of sketchy close fights. Go look at the first Gustafson fight. So John Jones isn't full-blown dominating every single person he fights. Sometimes those fights are closer than they should be. I don't think Dominic Reyes wins. I think Dustin Jacoby wins. What makes it weird is that $9,000 price point. Do you think he finishes Dominic Reyes, who has been finished three times in a row? If so, he's worth the money. If it's a decision, he's nowhere worth the money. I'll let you make that choice. If you think Dominic Reyes gets knocked out for the fourth time in a row for his fifth loss in a row to just ride off into oblivion, then Dustin Jacoby needs to be in your lineup. If you think it's a pitter-patter striking match, then fade Dustin Jacoby. And then we have the main event of the evening, Nasruddin Imovov versus Jared Cannonier. This is another interesting fight. This is a very good matchup right here because Nasruddin Imovov is a prospect. He's a good guy. He's a good fighter. He's very, very long for this weight class. He's a busy striker. He's constantly working forward, trying to get something done. He can work in some takedowns. His game plan against Chris Curtis was take him down. He took him down three times before the headbutt. And he put up 42 points in a fight that had no decision and ended in the second round. He just worked the leads over five rounds, just beat his ass over five rounds. Just lit him up, was clearly the better striker. Nasty Nimovov is good. He's very well-rounded and he's very good. That loss is to Sean Strickland. Didn't look great in that fight, but he still landed 131 significant or strikes total with 123 of them being significant. He just couldn't get the wrestling going and Sean Strickland's forward pressure, nonstop striking, got it done. Losing to Phil Hawes three years ago, that's not the best look. But Phil Hawes is wildly talented. Nasser Dinimov is very good, but this is a tough matchup. Yes, Jared Cannonier is 40. I get it. He's 40. But in this Marvin Vittori fight, Look at that, 155 points. He looked better than ever. That is the best he has ever looked in a fight at 40 years older. Maybe he was 39 at the time. That was 10 months ago. Jared Cannonier has big power in his hands. Jared Cannonier can wrestle. He's got forward pressure. He's insanely durable, has insane cardio, and as we just saw in this last fight, insane volume as well. I think Jared Cannonier can win this fight. Certainly, if the Jared Cannonier that beat Marvin Vittori shows up, that guy can win. I'm going to have Jared Cannonier in my lineup at $7,600 because let's look at his losses. Oh, a decision to Israel Adesanya, maybe the greatest middleweight of all time. Decision to Robert Whitaker, prime Robert Whitaker. He did get finished by Reyes. That's the only one that doesn't hold up. But okay, a decision to Jan Blahomic, former champion. All of these losses are to former champions. Glover Teixeira, decision, former world champion. Jared Cannonier can win this fight. I think he might win this fight, and I will spend the $7,600 on him in DraftKings. Guys, become a premium member. It's freaking $10 a month. You'll unlock the cheat sheet with the ownership projections. They will be preloaded into the DraftKings optimizer. You will have access to everything that we do, and you can join this community that has won over half of a million dollars in the last six months. We just had Bogey Terp putting up a $7,500 winning lineup last week for UFC 302. Go to wewantpicks.com, click become a member. It's only $10 for an entire month's worth of access.